good afternoon, everyone. Today, the ATOM seminar has the great pleasure of welcoming Professor Eric Frost. Uh, Professor Frost received his bachelor's with university honors in chemical engineering from the Carnegie Mellon University and his PhD from Stanford University. Uh, he is now a professor of chemical and biomolecular engineering at the University of Delaware. Uh, his research focuses on the physics and chemistry of soft materials, including colloids, polymers, biomolecular material, uh, interfacial phenomena, and rheology. Uh, he co-authored the book Microreology of Oxford University Press and is the recipient of the NASA Exceptional Scientific Achievement Medal and the University Excellence in Undergraduate Advising and Mentoring Award the College of Engineering Excellence in Teaching Award, and he is also a fellow of the American Chemical Society and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. So once again, welcome Professor Frost. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation and you can feel free to start your presentation. Thank you so much. I really uh, want to thank everybody for this wonderful invitation to present work, work today uh, and get to know the Adams group a little bit better. Let me see if uh, so I got the slides up there and you should be able to see that now. And I'm going to just uh, open a couple other windows here before I get started. So we yeah, it's OK. Available. Good. OK, excellent. So uh, thanks again. And, uh, and, you know, I was really having fun uh, discussing as we as before the meeting, uh, just the connections between Delaware and uh, and the Adams group. Uh, you know, a lot of thermodynamics uh, work has gone on at the University of Delaware for the past 40 or 50 years. Uh, and it's been host to many people, uh, you know, and it's just wonderful to carry on that tradition and talk about some of the ways that we've been um, using those principles uh, to study uh, the self-assembly of colloids. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, what I've come to think of as dissipative self-assembly of colloidal dispersions. So uh, let me just get started and I'll, I'll, let me just tell you about the experiment first. Um, this is, uh, whoops, let's see if I can actually get the slides to advance. So hopefully on Zoom, this video is, uh, is captured at the bandwidth that we have, but uh, what you're looking at are uh, colloidal particles, about a micron in diameter. They're pretty uniform in size, you can see that. And uh, they have Brownian motion, so they move around thermally. And the video is repeating, so you'll see it. You'll see it uh, move uh, back and forth. Uh, and what's happening is that these particles are magnetic. They're paramagnetic, in fact. And so when you put a magnetic field, when you place them in a magnetic field, uh, there's an induced dipole interaction that causes those particles to, to to create a little magnetic moment that then interacts. And that interaction is on the order of kT, right? Because it's uh, beginning to pull those particles together, and you can see that they're aligning in the field direction, aggregating. Uh, or associating with one another uh, by those induced dipole moments, basically, but but still very thermally active, right? So you suspect uh, that you should be able to start to uh, equilibrate structures because of that thermal motion, you know, that the principles of thermodynamics will, will hold. And uh, as you change an interaction, you would change the phases of that material. So that's what I'll tell you a little bit about today. Um, in fact, uh, here's a picture of those particles. Uh, they're, they're not quite uniformly smooth, uh, they're rough, uh, but they are uniform in size. And these are just commercial uh, materials that you can buy. They're polystyrene, so it's a polystyrene matrix, um, but inside that polystyrene are nanometer, tens of nanometer, well, actually a little under 10 nanometer size iron oxide particles. And it's those iron oxide particles that have a super paramagnetic uh, behavior to them uh, because they, uh, uh, have a have a domain, they have a size which is smaller than a single domain size for that what is normally ferrometric, ferromagnetic material. Those little dipoles of the iron oxide uh, thermally fluctuate as well. And so there's no net dipole moment in these particles uh, in the absence of a field. But when you apply a field, all those little iron oxide moments start to align in the field direction. And that's what gives rise to the super paramagnetic behavior uh, of the colloids themselves. This is a little illustration of that basically in terms of the magnetization. So this is measured with a vibrating sample magnetometer. Uh, and you can see that the, the magnetization is paramagnetic. There's no uh, remnant magnetization at zero field. 
Uh, and eventually it does saturate, but we're going to be interested in a regime of field strengths because that's up around 200,000 uh, amps per meter. We're, we're usually around 1,000 or so where the interactions are sufficiently strong and we can induce interactions on the order of 100 kT or so uh, in that interaction, but where the magnetization will be essentially linear. So you have a susceptibility of about 1.4. And again, the, each particle has a magnetic moment. Uh, that's induced by the external field, and so it's dependent on the particle volume and that and that and that and that susceptibility, and that gives rise to that dipole interaction, which I've just shown, which I write up on the top right of the screen, right? So it's a dipole-dipole interaction, which is anisotropic, repulsive when the particles are side by side, and attractive when they're uh, when they're next or they align uh, tip to tail, basically in the field direction. So you're looking, uh, you're looking across the field here, and these are particles are heavy, so they're sedimenting down to the glass slide that they're on, uh, and uh, you're you're watching them chain in the field direction. So just that, I want you to keep that sort of uh, uh, perspective in mind because I'm going to be changing perspectives a couple times uh, throughout the talk. Now, if you this is a very dilute case, right, where you see these individual chains form uh, in the in the suspension, and and they fluctuate. Uh, you'll see some particles popping on and off of those because they uh, eventually will sort of, at, at a low enough field strength, will equilibrate into a, a distribution of sizes, basically. Um, but at higher concentration and higher field strengths, this is normally what you see. Now, this is a much higher concentration and a much lower magnification. So you don't see individual particles in this case. Uh, but what you're looking at are those particles coming together. They're forming chains very rapidly. And then those chains interlink with one another and you end up with this arrested state uh, that's gel-like, right? And uh, there's strands of, uh, or columns of particles that are uh, all sort of networked together, basically. Um, and this represents, you know, at a high enough field strength and a high enough concentration, essentially an arrested state, which is gel-like. So this is a non-equilibrium state of the suspension. Uh, and uh, this is the basis of technologies like electro-rheological fluids and magneto-rheological fluids, because that, that strong, that structure, that arrested structure has uh, an elasticity to it. it. It'll yield at a sufficiently high stress. And so you have something which has an, uh, has an elastic solid-like behavior, which is tunable and controllable by the field uh, that you're applying, uh, applying to it. Um, but a more interesting thing happens. So I can, I can tailor the field string. Right, So I can move the field strength. That's like changing temperature in these suspensions. But I can do another thing, which is really interesting. And this, this is what's sort of coming into the idea of dissipative self-assembly. Instead of applying a steady field to these suspensions, I can toggle the field. I can, I can turn it on and off, right? And so if you think about that from the perspective of a particle and its interactions, it's like changing the temperature very rapidly. You induce an attractive interaction between the particles, and then you turn that attraction off, and the particles uh, just move by their Brownian motion, really almost as hard spheres, a little bit of stabilization by charge, uh, but uh, you know some sort of effective hard sphere-like interaction. And what's neat about this is, well, uh, in that process, we can change that interaction through changing the field with a variety of parameters. We can change the frequency at which we turn that on and off, right? And so the period of on and the period of off will get shorter, right? As we, as we go to higher frequencies or longer as we go to lower frequencies. Uh, and we can change also the duty ratio, the ratio of the time that that field is on to the time that it's off and explore that as a parameter. We can change the field strength as well, uh, you know, anywhere from KT to hundreds of KT. And when we do that, under certain conditions, when we toggle the field, instead of that arrested gel-like state that I showed you in the last video, uh, we see this. Uh, we see a suspension, and this is a sped up movie of the suspension, so there's a time-lapse video of it. Uh, but you can see that suspension now uh, breaks up into individual domains. It really phase separates, basically, into a condensed uh, phase of concentrated particles and uh, a very dilute phase surrounding those particles, surrounding those condensed uh, sort of droplet-like structures. Um, I'll, let me replay this video because it's really pretty wild in the sense of um, that you see elements of the kinetics of phase separation like a like a process of spinodal decomposition. If you look very carefully, you'll see a wavy structure initially form, and the and those instabilities uh, coarsen just like a Rayleigh plateau instability. So this is really almost analogous to late stage spinodal decomposition uh, in fluids, 
right? But these are colloids with very strong attractions induced between them. And we're just toggling the interaction between, uh, between those particles. And we're getting this sort of equilibrium like uh, 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 this, this movement, this kinetics of phase separation to an equilibrium-like structure. Now, they're also pretty dynamic, which is neat. You can start to see them rotate around and, and move and coalesce and things like that. That's because these domains are magnetic and they're interacting magnetically with one another. So, uh, but those are long time sort of uh, changes because this is a sped up movie. So if we do this experiment, we can change the frequency, we can change the duty ratio. And my student, um, we've studied this over a number of years. You can see some of the references there. Uh, but my student, Ho Jin Kim, most recently uh, studied this over a pretty wide range of uh, frequencies, which we're plotting here as a time scale that the field is off. Uh, so high frequencies is on the left of this plot and low frequencies is on the right of this plot and, and duty fraction. What you're seeing right now is a phase, basically a state diagram a uh, phase diagram of sorts, but it has non-equilibrium structures in it too, of the structures that form under those conditions, right? Of when we go to when we go to high frequencies, we remain in that sort of percolated structure, like I showed you, like the field was steady. And then as we go to lower and lower frequencies, we start to see that breakup phenomena occurring. We start to see a phase separation. If we go to low enough frequencies, uh, we see a different sort of phase where it doesn't break up into discrete droplets, but remains in these sort of column-like structures. We even see at the very lowest duty ratios and, 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 and frequencies, uh, which I'll show you correspond to kind of a characteristic relaxation timescale in the suspension. We also see these very uh, interesting, what we call wavy structures, where those domains that form at, at the higher duty fractions start to sort of link up together perpendicular to the magnetic field. The magnetic field is uh, from, from the bottom to the top in these, uh, in these, uh, in these images. So that's quite interesting too. Uh, is this the equilibrium structure uh, is one thing that we wanted to ask. And we were able to show that in the middle of this uh, phase diagram, you do actually reach a structure which you would expect to be the equilibrium structure for paramagnetic particles at a high concentration. So these domains condense into crystals and we can show that they're body-centered tetragonal crystals of particles. Uh, these are some images uh, over the different frequencies that we looked at and right around in that sort of narrow, that window of frequencies around a hertz or two hertz, we can see the particles uh, forming these very ordered structures. So we can induce crystallization. We can reach an equilibrium crystal state by toggling the field. We can demonstrate that we can look at multiple images and show it's, it's stacking. And you're looking down basically at the uh, 110 plane of a BCT crystal. And in fact, actually calculations later, uh, calculations show, uh, you know, early in the literature in 1992, you have Tor and Halsey and Tao and Sun and others calculating the low energy state of these uh, paramagnetic particles. Um, and, they're, and they should be BCT. And, and Zach Sherman and, and Jim Swan and coworkers had also uh, done uh, computer simulations and thermodynamic theory showing that those are the equilibrium phases as well. And we can confirm it further with light scattering. And this, this is interesting as well because you can see that crystallinity in the light scattering patterns. You can see the ordered structures uh, of the particle neighbors uh, uh, forming. And you can see also how that changes as you change the parameters. So in the percolated state, uh, maybe a little bit of local sort of crystallinity, but very much more disordered uh, with a lot of uh, scattering power representing that sort of uh, fragmented structure of the fibers. Uh, and then at the, at the highest uh, time, uh, off times or the lowest frequencies, that columnar phase really looking like a more of a like those are uh, like a fluid fluid coexistence because we lose all the crystallinity basically in those structures and then as we go a little bit lower in duty ratio you can still see the crystallinity is uh, is there uh, for those wavy like structures as well all right so uh, so those are the, so those are the structures and the phases uh, that we see so there's some really interesting analogs, right, between this sort of very non-equilibrium process toggling the field and yet the fact that we reach sort of equilibrium structures. And this has been something that we've, you know, been really curious about studying these structures and thinking about, uh, you know, what that, you know, how, how one might model this and, and, and think about this type of process. And I just put this slide up because I think it's really striking, right, that you, that you think about this is, the, this is a field, it's a very strong field. Under those conditions, when the field is steady, you reach a non-equilibrium structure, which is like a gel. 
you know, so if you take a colloidal dispersion and you put a very strong attraction between the particles, right, they, they, they gel, they form a percolated network. Um, that percolated network, because of those strong interactions, localizes particles and you lose the ability to thermally equilibrate because of that localization. And, and similarly, other non-equilibrium non states like glasses, right, you've concentrated particles sufficiently so that they lose that sort of dynamic property uh, of, 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 of being able to explore phase space and eventually uh, form equilibrium structures because particles are highly localized and constrained by their neighbors. Um, but if I toggle this field, if I turn it on and off, right, I reach these equilibrium structures. And these are, these are images from uh, Promislow and Gast from uh, uh, the nineties showing these sort of uh, droplet like phases uh, that, are, that are similar to the ones I've been showing, right? Um, in fact, actually the overall shape is like an equilibrium shape of these uh, droplet like structures elongating in the field uh, like you would expect a, a structure to do. And I, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So there's some emerging ideas around this kind of idea of toggling an interaction and getting a, getting a state of matter, which is different than, you know, what would happen at a steady, under steady field conditions, a steady interaction. So think of this as a time dependent interaction potential. Uh, and some really interesting work by Tagliazucci and Emily Weiss and Eagle Zeifler uh, at, uh, 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 in Chicago uh, explored this kind of idea in some computational studies uh, right around when we were starting to publish our work. Uh, and um, they had a really interesting idea and they, they simulated it where they said, well, what, what would happen between colloids or particles if uh, the charge was oscillating? You know, and you can imagine that would happen if you change the pH in a controlled way. So you oscillated the pH. And so they studied these interactions that, that resulted from that. And they used a, a, a suspension, they, 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 they modeled a suspension where the charges, the pH uh, uh, dependence uh, was kind of opposite. So you go through periods of particles being repulsive because they had the same charge and then these sort of mixed systems having an attractive interaction. And what they found of course was that you saw very different structures emerge when you had that dynamic potential versus that static potential. And they, they actually coined this idea of dissipated self-assembly to describe that. They could if they explore the phase behavior much like we've studied looking at different, different, um, different characteristic functions of that oscillation, different frequencies, et cetera. And they showed different structures forming. The, the most striking I think is this one where if you had a static potential or a dynamic potential, and the average was the same. Basically, you uh, you reached a percolated, you know, sort of structure of crystals in the static potential, um, kind of somewhat, you know, quasi equilibrated, basically into these crystal-like structures, but percolated, uh, you know, in terms of uh, those aggregates of, uh, of those crystals forming, uh, and yet this wavy, you know, structure formed under the dynamic potentials is very different. Right than that that static one. Of course, this this is a complicated sort of model where the interactions are uh, 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 complicated by the fact that you know you're you're switching and you have a you have a binary system basically where there's some attraction and some repulsion between the particles as that oscillates. As you go through a period of pH changes, you have uh, these B type particles, for instance, being repulsive. You have a more hard sphere interaction between the A and B particles. Then as you go up in pH, uh, now you have attraction between A and B. Uh, but repulsion between the BB and the AA, you know, so it, so it ends up being quite complicated. And it's hard to map this on to what we were doing with the toggled fields. Um, but uh, around a little bit after that, Jim Swan and Zach Sherman really developed some other interesting theory and, and their insight into this. I thought this would be particularly interesting to talk about with the Adams group today uh, because of because of the modeling that uh, they were doing. Uh, you know, they they had the insight to say, well, let's just simplify this. You know, let's let's do what we always do in a colloidal system and really think about the the very basic interactions that we could that we could describe the the suspension with. And and so what they did was they said, well, you know, really what we want to study is a toggled interaction, but what if that toggling was between um, uh, a hard sphere, right? One basis of a, a suspension and a sticky hard sphere. So it's just some isotropic sticky interaction. And that allowed them to, to study a very simple interaction where you have, uh, you know, um, uh, you, you, you have, uh, um, uh, you know, precise descriptions of the thermodynamics in terms of the pressure, uh, the, the pressure of, of those phases, the, the, um, 
uh, the pressure of the material, the, the uh, chemical potential of the material, right? You have, you actually have analytic expressions in both cases. Um, so, uh, you know, but it also gave them enough complexity to say, well, I can also, I can change the frequency of that toggling. I can change the duty ratio. I can change the interaction strength. And I can see how those all map onto one another. And so they did this. It was a computational study with some really beautiful theory, uh, a linearized non-equilibrium theory. And, and they showed, well, you know, you really are starting to see phases, much like the ones I showed you for the magnetics case, uh, at, at a high duty fraction of that interaction potential and high frequencies, you reach these sort of percolated structures in their, in their work. In, uh, as you go to lower frequencies, you start to see fluid crystal phase separation and you get, you get crystallization out of that. In fact, you, have, you even have one step and two step crystallization phenomena occurring. Uh, depending on depending on the uh, duty fraction and the frequency, and then at, at the the lowest frequencies, you see this fluid fluid phase separation, and and cases also where you see no assembly uh, at a low enough duty fraction. So um, what was really stunning about that work, as I mentioned, was that you could you can actually write out uh, analytic expressions for these two two, two phases, the pressure and the uh, and the chemical potential. And what Zach and Jim showed was that if you calculated the time average chemical potentials between the, the solid and the fluid phases or the fluid and fluid phases, for instance, and the time average pressures of those, you could describe a phase diagram uh, that modeled uh, their simulations very well. And so they're, they're taking a chemical potential or a pressure of a particular phase, right? And they're just they're just time averaging it over an entire period of it being on, of it being on and off. And what's fascinating about these time average equations of state for these two for the cases of a hard sphere and an adhesive hard sphere is that really you have the analytic expression for the pressure and the chemical potential for a hard sphere. You have the the function as a function of volume fraction that you get from the sticky hard sphere, which is an analytic function that we know of the volume fraction. Uh, and normally you have basically the interaction strength, this is epsilon multiplied by those functions. And that's the pressure and the chemical potential of a sticky hard sphere, for instance. How the time average modifies this is it basically multiplies that interaction strength by a ratio of the duty fractions, eta over eta plus one. And so it's like you're tuning the attractive interaction basically based on the uh, basically based on the duty ratio. And so both the equilibrium uh, phase diagrams and these non-equilibrium phase diagrams essentially show the same sort of uh, phase diagram behavior that you, you normally see for an attractive hard sphere, a sticky hard sphere. On the left is the attraction, the attractive strength. So uh, getting more attractive as we go up in, in units of KT, volume fractions on the bottom plot. And you see the characteristics of the fluid crystal transition of sticky hard spheres. Um, you see the characteristic for a short range attraction of the, of the metastable fluid fluid phase uh, that you see. Uh, this is for an attractive strength of about 10 kT. But that you also plot on top of this, basically, uh, that attraction times the DD ratio uh, as well. And, and the symbols here are the simulations. So what they're showing is that the simulations fall onto this thermodynamic theory. And uh, moreover, what the simulations represent is, for instance, that the steady state of the non-equilibrium process is an equilibrium state that you can calculate, right? But it, but it represents a, a constant steady state. So it's, not, it's no longer metastable. You can actually dial in metastable states in this non-equilibrium process. Anyway, those results were so fascinating and they went further to show that it actually worked for the for induced interactions as well. So they, they looked at electric field induced uh, interpolarizable interactions between particles, plotted out the phase diagram, showed that similar things occur with the sticky hard spheres. And this is exactly what we're studying basically in the magnetic system, right? Mutually induced dipoles. Uh, they looked at electrostatics, but it's the, it's the same problem. And they come up with a phase diagram, which essentially matches uh, the experiments that, that Ho Jin Kim did uh, with duty fraction and uh, frequency or off time. I uh, shifted by a little bit in time and not quite sure why that's the case, but really super good agreement still with percolated states uh, fluid crystal states and uh, fluid fluid phase separation exactly where we see them uh, in our experiments as well. Okay, so I, I just want to pause because I think you know this the experiment I described to you the theory that's developed really sort of 
identifies a whole, a little different view of self-assembly, right? We have equilibrium self-assembly, where right? we're just following thermodynamics and seeing crystallization and fluid-fluid phase separation. We also have, you know, sort of non-equilibrium routes to self-assembly that have been explored in the literature. We have ideas of directed self-assembly, where you use external fields to kind of nudge an equilibrium process along. We've explored this quite a bit in my group, where you use an external uh, field to orient anisotropic particles, for instance. And that orientation basically removes a degree of freedom that allows you to uh, avoid uh, uh, glassy states, for instance, and pack particles together into their crystalline structures at, at high volume fractions. Um, there's also a lot of work in dynamic self-assembly where there's a constant input of energy, right? And that drives uh, through through interactions that you're, you're that are driven by that in, uh, that that int introduction of energy that drives patterns in self assembly and I, I think one really good example of that's colloids and electric uh, uh, AC electric fields you can start to see these uh, sort of uh, zigzag like structures that self assemble because of the electrohydrodynamic phenomena that are occurring around those particles in, the, in an AC field uh, and uh, oh it looks like this got cut off a little bit but. Uh, Oh, you, you also have the phenomena of active uh, particles and active swimmers and, and, and that, you know, illustrated by the self-organization of microtubules where you have the action of molecular motors acting on them or swimming particles, right, which is a, which is a, uh, a, a huge area uh, currently that people have been exploring computationally and experimentally and the self-assembly that comes out of that. Um, but I just want to emphasize, I, I think this idea of dissipated self-assembly really is quite a bit distinct. Okay, so let's see, time-wise, I, I think I have about 10 or 15 more minutes, and that gives me enough time to tell you a little bit about um, uh, the experiments a little bit more, uh, and, and some of the other features of that, as well as uh, why we, we ended up taking these experiments to space, and what we're seeing there, and kind of where it's left us, and, and maybe that uh, we can introduce some ideas uh, for you uh, to think about some modeling uh, in, these types of, uh, in these types of materials. Um, so let me come back to the experiment that I showed you initially, right? The magnetic particles. This is a dark field microscopy image, and you can really see the, the beautiful breakup phenomena that's going to occur in this, the Rayleigh plateau instability and, and some more of the features there. Um, oops. Let me play that for you. So, so you really see the waviness of the structure sort of in your form and, and that breakup process, right, of these structures. And, and I just, you know, one of the things that's kind of interested us is the fact that, you know, well, these domains that we form, you know, uh, you know, are, what, what do they represent? Do they represent some equilibrium in themselves? And Joanne Promislow and her work in the 90s really showed that you know, there's energetic descriptions of these, there's energy descriptions based on really what you would think of as uh, constant field uh, interactions, but we can think of now as uh, uh, sort of time averaged interactions, right? There's, there's energetic concerns which describe why these uh, particular structures are anisotropic. And uh, let me just take you through that a little bit because it sets up a, a few things that we've been thinking about in terms of the structure of these aggregates. One is that, well, if I have an aggregate, now this is a bot, this isn't just one particle that I'm showing you here. This is a, some, some aggregate of particles, right, into a domain, a ma some magnetic domain. We can write the magnetic energy of that, that as, as the magnetic moment of that aggregate uh, and its scalar product with a magnetic field. And in this calculation of that interaction energy, there's two contributions. There's a volume contribution and there's a surface contribution to that energy. The volume contribution is one that you should uh, you should really um, uh, probably think of immediately, right? If you're thinking about electrostatics or magnetostatics, um, because uh, there's a, a depolarizing field. That's the essentially the dipole that you're forming. There's a depolarizing field. This is written for electric fields uh, that gives rise to that dipole, and, and the result is that there's a mag the magnetic or electric field which is lower inside that magnetic body, inside that dielectric body than the surroundings. And that gives rise to a volume energy uh, in, these, uh, in these bodies, which should stretch them out, okay? So the volume energy, if you calculate that uh, based on its shape, right, is always decreasing as a function of aspect ratio. A, a here is the uh, uh, long longitudinal uh, radius and B is the, uh, is the uh, uh, latitudinal radius of, of that aggregate. And you can see it just keeps decreasing. And, and, and it makes sense, right? Because the longer and skinnier my uh, domain is, uh, then, um, you know, the lower, uh, the, the less volume I have with that demagnetizing field. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I have a lower energy because more, more particles are seeing a, a, a higher magnetic field, basically. 
Um, but there's, because there's a discreteness to this, you know, there's this domain, you know, so we, we don't see that, right? We see finite length uh, objects in our experiments, but that's because the, there's, the, the domains are actually composed of particles and there is a surface energy associated with that. That is that particles on the edges of those domains uh, still feel the half of the magnetic field because of the, because of the, or some fraction of the magnetic field because of the demagnetizing field, but they also lose the interaction with neighboring particles. So it's a sort of classic picture of a surface tension or a surface energy, right? You have, you have particles on the outside of the aggregate. And this is just thinking about this isotropically. So we're not taking into account the anisotropy of this interaction. Yet. Uh, and, and that interaction gets rise to surface energy, which then increases as you would increase the surface area. Right, so that means that there's going to be some compromise between the two, which gives rise to sort of a finite structure of that, uh, a, a finite length uh, aspect ratio of those structures. So if I plot the total energy of that surface and volume energy, there's a broad minimum, right, that tells you that there's a range of uh, sort of characteristic aspect ratios that you're going to see in that. So these are the energetics of the domains. Again, sort of a time average property, we think of it. And this is a very simple description of it. In fact, actually, we, there's lots of cool calculations and we're going back and re-exploring this, um, especially by Tor and Halsey, uh, that show the different energies of different faces of BCT crystals. And there's the idea that, you know, uh, there's uh, a pretty big energy penalty for forming uh, surfaces perpendicular to the field direction. And that's why we see some of these, uh, these very spiky sort of shapes in our, in our suspensions. But everything I've shown you, I just wanna introduce that because everything I've shown you, right, is also in gravity. And so gravity is an important component of the total energy of these aggregates and that flattens the structures out. Uh, and so uh, one of the things that we wanted to do in all of these uh, studies were to think about, well, what happens if we didn't have that gravitational energy? That, that's flattening a structure out. We don't really know how that affects the overall structure. And the, they're dense enough, these, these domains and these particles are dense enough that really there's no other way to do the experiment in microgravity other than to send it to the space station. It's too long of a phenomenon to study with uh, ballistic uh, air, aircraft flights and ro sounding rockets and drop towers, et cetera. So, so we sent our experiments to the space station, worked with a bunch of astronauts and very exciting work. And I'll just show you some of the results there as I, as I wrap up my talk, because they lead to some really kind of interesting results that we're still working on and, and thinking about. Um, so the experiment's the same. We're toggling the field on and off. We're looking at structure. We can look in these cases because we have a three-dimensional structure, you know, not just looking at particles on a microscope slide. Uh, we can, we can um, see perpendicular to the field, which are the black and white images I'm showing. You can see that coarsening of the suspension structures, just like I showed you in the coarsening processes earlier. We can also look perpendicular to the field. And um, we don't always get the same information, but we've been able to do complementary experiments where we get both uh, sort of conditions. Uh, so this is a video off the space station showing that coarsening process. I'll just I'll play this a little bit, uh, but I wanna move on so we have some time for questions. And you can just see the coarsening happening. Um, and what you don't see is that sort of Rayleigh plateau breakup, but we do see signs of that late stage sort of spinodal decomposition. It's, it's, we just don't have the image fidelity to really see that kind of breakup. Uh, this is a time-lapse image, remember, and then we actually speed up the time-lapse. This was uh, back in the mid 2000s, so our imaging wasn't quite as good either. Um, but you can see you can, there's those structures condensing. Actually, when you turn the field off, you can also see the particles redispersed, right? So it shows you that it's being formed by the interaction. And those experiments really replicated one of the aspects of our phase diagram where there's a frequency dependence of forming a percolated state from a condensed state. And you can look at the kinetics of that, 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 that structure change, right? And you can see in cases where you have phase separation that there's really kind of a two, two, two characteristic uh, processes. One where you see a long thermal process of coarsening and then a final breakup process where you start to see um, some uh, rapid phase separation. Whoops, sorry, I skipped ahead a little bit. So that, that characteristic scaling of the structure size, the width of those structures versus time uh, is reminiscent of that sort of late stage spinodal decomposition in terms of that exponent. It's exactly what we see in our ground-based experiments as well. But the more recent experiments, we've been looking at the structure now changing duty ratio and frequencies. And we started to see some really interesting and intriguing things. And uh, this is work that we're still working out. Uh, 
Um, so we see, now we're looking along the field direction and we see uh, sort of isotropic structures forming, pretty quiescent in terms of not moving around, not coarsening very much, and very reminiscent of what you might imagine looking at the, at, at the sort of ends of the percolated structure. And if we go way over in our phase diagram, which was, uh, you know, this is the phase diagram from the ground-based experiments, uh, we see structures which we think are probably, you know, the ends of those columns of fluid, fluid phases, basically. Uh, there's a lot more, it's a much darker image because there's a lot more uh, equilibrium between dispersed particles and the condensed particles. Um, but here's the really stunning results. As we went into the center sort of of our uh, phase diagram, what we see are really anisotropic structures forming. So almost pancake or sheet-like structures. Um, these are sped up, so you have to be a little bit careful. They're very dynamic, right? But over long time scales. So you can see the flow of other little aggregates between these bigger structures. And that's something we're really curious about. But that, that flow, again, is very slow. Um, we're seeing a very sped up version of this. These are actually far more uh, dynamic structures uh, as we get a lower and lower duty ratios forming these uh, really sheet-like structures. Uh, and, and that was really surprising, you know, based on the energy calculations that we're doing, et cetera. So we have a phase diagram of these uh, structures. Um, uh, uh, and, and we see them, they follow the sort of same sort of pattern of what we were seeing in the ground-based experiments uh, in terms of interaction strength and, and uh, the frequency showing these different sort of what we think of as percolated structures and maybe uh, regions where we see those ellipsoidal structures and ribbon-like structures and then the fluid fluid phases. Um, but really it's these anisotropic structures that I think are, are really quite stunning uh, and something that we really didn't expect. Why, why, do they, why do they form? Why do these magnetic particles form these long uh, anisotropic aggregates, basically. And so, and just to, just to show you, this is the real-time video on the right. So even though I showed you that they're very dynamic, it's a slow process. It's occurring over a course of an hour, basically. And so on the right-hand video, you can see that kind of toggling on and off. I think the answer is, and, and we're, so we're going back and we're doing calculations now of the total energies of these and really thinking about the time average interaction potentials, the mutual polarization that's happening, the different, different, uh, different, surfaces that you could be forming in terms of the crystallographic surfaces and really getting into the calculation of the total energies to try to understand this. But I think probably the, the, the basic idea is this, that if you calculate that total energy that I showed you earlier versus an aspect ratio, this is a series of curves that shows for each curve, basically, and the blue curve is, is starting off as a sphere uh, and, and, and this is a, this is a uh, uh, ellipsoid of revolution that's becoming a prolate ellipsoid, right? And that, that tells you that there's going to be some aspect ratio of a prolate ellipsoid, which is the minimum energy. And that should be the structure that, we're, that we would form. Uh, you know, this doesn't account for anisotropy of the interact of, of the surface energies, et cetera. So you have to be a little bit careful about this, but I think it still provides some insight. Now, if I, if I go along that sort of aspect ratio of one here, right, this is flattening that object from a sphere to an oblate uh, ellipsoid. And so all of these curves represent different sort of, uh, you know, general ellipsoids where A, B, and C are different radii. And what you see is like, well, if I start with a prolate ellipsoid, which is the minimum energy, there's not much energy penalty for it to flatten out. Right, so it's probably just telling us that that's uh, that, you know that that's that, that we should see these anisotropic structures, and what might be happening in the ribbon-like structure is um, how those st structures actually grow. I, I don't know. That's the one that still puzzles me the most. But I think I, I'm starting to understand why we see at least some anisotropy uh, in the structures themselves. Let me just end with one thing, and that is okay. This is building, you know, basically looking at self-assembly. This process of dissipative self-assembly. The other interest that I have had in all of this is, can you use this to make functional materials? Uh, you know, stuff that, materials that have interesting properties. And of course, I'm, I'm taking particles which are dispersed and getting them to self-organize. Those self-organized particles should change the way energy flows. Uh, you know, they should, I should exhibit, you know, interesting photonic properties, interesting phononic properties, et cetera, because of the lattice structures uh, of the, that are forming. Um, you know, the, the scalability of self-assembly really interests me. And so we've done this with different particle shapes and different sizes. And, and in all of this work, we've also explored, you know, as we build these anisotropic structures, these are dumbbell particles that have been organized into big crystals. 
uh, of monoclinic uh, uh, crystals of these uh, these particles. We've been exploring their phononic properties. You know, they exhibit really cool structural color and the phononic properties. They exhibit really interesting acoustic phonon uh, uh, behavior. And we just have this paper accepted in ACS Nano coming out showing um, Bragg uh, band gaps in these anisotropic crystals. Those Bragg band gaps are dependent on the orientation because of the anisotropy of the particles, something which hasn't been seen uh, uh, in the past. They also exhibit interesting hybridization gaps, which are known for, for colloidal systems as well. Uh, and what was neat and, and very rewarding is Hojin Kim, the student that did this work, showed that, in fact, it's really hard to model this. So this is why I wanted to bring this up because you know people in, in in the group there may be interested in you know some of the some of this sort of more atomistic like modeling uh, of these band gaps um, it, it's it's difficult to get the precise uh, dispersion relations that give us these band gaps but you can show that you can do simple scalings of them uh, and relate those Bragg and hybridization band gaps to just characteristic structures of the crystal which if you, if you normalize your sort of band gaps based on the, the frequency and the, and the wave vectors based on uh, those uh, parameters, those, le those structural parameters, um, they seem to uh, collapse basically data that we have for spheres and these dumbbell particles and, and some other systems. Okay, so I wanted to end with that. Uh, really like, um, I was so excited to talk to the group today because, you know, for me, colloids are like just big molecules, uh, big atoms that we can see and we can study. We can explore things like phase behavior. Uh, we also have interesting, you know, I'm not sure there's a molecular uh, 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 analog to being able to change the interaction like this, at, you know, such a uh, on the characteristic time scale relaxation of the particles, for instance, here in this case. Um, but we have really interesting ways of exploring, um, you know, the, the steady state behavior non-equilibrium processes with uh, equilibrium thermodynamic pro um, properties as well. And so I, I hope I was able to convey, you know, some exciting ideas around dissipative self-assembly uh, that I, I feel like it's a unique uh, area from, you know, what's been done in self-assembly, especially the, uh, the ideas of directed and dynamic self-assembly. And I, I, I really want to highlight the fact that, you know, there's some emerging design roles and, and thermodynamic theory for these. Uh, our experiments are very similar, uh, right? And, but there's still so many interesting questions about coexisting phases and where the percolation lines are. Uh, the kinetics are complex. Uh, the macroscopic structures are still, you know, waiting to be explored and difficult right now computationally because the, just the system sizes that we're able to do experimentally are much larger than what you can do computationally. But the physics are really rich in this problem. Uh, and so I hope that it inspires people to, to think about it. And maybe even experimentalists thinking about, you know, how we could do this with other interactions. So let me thank, uh, wrap up. I went a little long and I apologize for that, but let me wrap up. Uh, by uh, thanking the people that contributed to this, Paula, John, Hojin, Jason, Ife, Martin, uh, and Mar Marjorie, students in my research group, both undergraduates and graduates, um, Jim Swan, especially, uh, a dear colleague who, who I miss uh, terribly, uh, who really just had some inspiring work in the area with his student, Zach Sherman, who's now a professor at the University of Washington, so carrying on the work. I want to thank uh, our collaborators at Zim Technologies and NASA for the implementation of our experiments. Here's a beautiful picture of the East Coast from the space station. I'll thank uh, NSF and CASIS for funding. And uh, I thank you for your time. I actually want to flip forward a little bit and just give a special shout out to Jason. This is Jason working on the experiments when we were working with the astronauts uh, doing the experiments uh, in, in, on the ISS. All right, thank you. I hope we have time for questions, uh, but I really appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to present to everybody today. Yeah.